welcome back so we uh, started off john chapter 18 we looked up to verse 11 uh, the arrest is now completed and jesus is being uh, now taken to annas uh, to the home of annas and all this is still uh, happening at night um, so uh, when you have a court trial being made uh, when when accusations are being brought against the accused it is all done in public with enough witnesses watching uh, so that everything is done in a just and fair and correct manner according to the legal procedures which have been laid down by the law of moses and by you know the leaders over the over the various centuries so so that everything is done in an orderly way in a correct way so that's basically how any trial should take place but over here everything is being done so crookedly it's being done in the night time when the, when the public will not be aware of what's going on and so they are going to fabricate um, charges and then they're going to present those fabricated charges to the public and you know um, uh, stir them up into a kind of riot and turn them all against jesus so uh, what are the actual facts what is really taking place behind the scenes the public is not being allowed to view that in fact not even the entire sanhedrin you know the the governing body which looked after jewish matters the entire sanhedrin is also not being allowed to watch all of this it's only um, some of the officials uh, some of the chief priests and pharisees who are uh, party to this which basically means you know it's basically the conspirators and those who are willing to support them who are uh, being allowed to watch all these secret proceedings and so then later when they go in front of the entire sanhedrin and when they go in front of the public they're just going to uh, give a summary of whatever they have fabricated and cooked up the reality is not going to come out so uh, we see here that right now uh, jesus is first taken to the home of annas annas is not even the high priest he is the father-in-law of the high priest so what we get to know is that uh, annas used to be the high priest uh, between ad 6 and 15 which we you know learn through historical records uh, so you know j just as a reminder none of this is fiction these are all historical events which actually took place these are uh, the, the names given here in these accounts we find these names in historical records so this is not a fabricated story they were, you know that we are looking at these are all things which really took place in history so annas was the high priest um, over the nation of uh, israel between ad 6 and ad 15 and then for some reason the romans depose him you know they remove him from his position and they place his son-in-law instead in the position of high priest uh, so we don't really know what happened uh, maybe the romans had political reasons for removing him or maybe uh, the annas the high priest did something crooked that he's not supposed to we don't really know why he was deposed but the uh, son-in-law was made the new high priest however annas continued to hold power so even though Caiaphas was the one now sitting in the you know in the chair of power, it's actually his father-in-law who was still running the show. And so Jesus is first taken to Anna's home. Uh, when I say home, it's not just one little home. You know, in case you're picturing a little house, this is going to be like a big mansion with a compound around it and all of that. So this is basically where Jesus is now taken. And um, you know, as we see in the other uh, gospels and over here. Uh, not everyone can enter into the compound. Uh, so only those with influence, only those you know who are able to um, have some um, some known person on the inside will be allowed to go inside and watch the secret proceedings that are taking place. Um, so uh, we are all very familiar with you know Peter denying Jesus. So we will kind of skip that um, uh, you know at the moment. Um, we will look at some of the other details which we generally don't. Know, tend to reflect upon so here uh, you basically have Caiaphas and Annas and the, all the others questioning Jesus um, if we could have someone read out for us uh, John chapter 18 verses 19 to 23 uh, 24 yeah 19 to 24 if someone could read out please they asked Jesus about his disciples 
I spoke openly to the world. I always talk in the books in the temple. But the church always went. And in secret, I said, Why do you ask me? Ask those who have everything. Then I said to them, Indeed, they know what I said. And when he had said these things, a couple of officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? Jesus answered him, I have spoken evil. The witness of the evil, but he fell by his way. Then Allah sent him down to death. I was the head. Yeah, so um, if you look at the setting over here, this is uh, the home of Anas. So probably the top conspirators, the high leaders are. Uh, you know, are the audience which is watching this proceedings. Uh, the rest of the people are not around. And uh, so they would have carefully prepared a list of questions which they're going to ask Jesus to trip him up, uh, to somehow get him to say the wrong things so that they can use that as charges. And so here in verse 19, we see that uh, now they start asking him questions about his doctrine, about his teachings. And they are, so uh, Jesus humiliates them. You know, he says, why are you asking all of these things? Like as if, you know, you're, you're getting to hear my teachings for the first time all along out in the open in the synagogue every day. I've been, you know, teaching these things. There's nothing uh, new uh, over here. So he says in verse 21, why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. So it's not like as if I've been, uh, you know, um, teaching any anything false in secret, openly out in the synagogue in front of the entire public. I have... Uh, spoken out what I believe in. So all my teachings are open for everyone uh, uh, and everyone is acquainted with them. So now why are you questioning me like as if you know I have some some uh, hidden teachings which are wrong, which are in some way against the law of Moses. And uh, so when Jesus says this mockingly, you know, um, uh, one of the officials slaps him in the face. And Jesus replies this. He says, you know, you're slapping me. Have I said anything wrong? If I have said anything wrong, then fine, you know, you, you, you testify about it. And he says, if, if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? So here they are, you know, trying to uh, trip Jesus up and they are humiliated, uh, you know, in front of all the all those people who are watching. Uh, so because Jesus is completely in the right, they can't find anything wrong in the things that he is saying. Always, if you I mean, uh, notice, Jesus always used the Old Testament scriptures to back up what he was saying. He never just said, um, um, you know, uh, anything that they can charge as being false, anything that, you know, can be portrayed as, uh, as um, going against what uh, they had been taught in the Old Testament. Because Jesus uh, showed again and again that he is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. So they actually could not find any defect in him. So Anas finally gives gives up, and um, he sends him off to his son-in-law's place. Uh, he sends him off to uh, to Caiaphas, the high priest. Uh, so um, that's one point that we can draw from this entire you know trial procedure. Um, moving on, maybe to another passage. Uh, if we could look at verses thirty-one to thirty-six, maybe. Yeah, someone could read out verses 31 to 36. This will be the um, you know uh, questioning that is being done by Pilate. Okay, so uh, verses 31 to 36. If someone could read out, please. Then Pilate said to him, "You Jew and Jews are going to kill you. Therefore, the Jews said to him, 'It is not lawful for us to kill you.' Then the same of the point is fulfilled, which is both signifying and guy." What does he to die? Then Pilate entered the Praetorian again, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for the gospel about this or did not just tell you this concerning thing? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have been for you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not of the world. Yes. Uh, 
Um, yeah, I mean, so sorry, your voice kind of faded out. Did you read out verse 36? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, we see that now, um, after failing to find any um, false charges, they bring him to Pilate, hoping that maybe Pilate will just simply, you know, issue uh, an order saying that he should be crucified. Um, so um, Pilate is not interested in this entire process simply because it's a religious matter and he never really had any interest in the uh, Jewish religious traditions. Uh, we learn from history that on various occasions, Pilate was rather indifferent to the concerns of the Jews. Uh, you know, whenever they tried to bring up religious matters, he in fact uh, spoke in a, uh, in a rather derogatory manner sometimes regarding the Jewish people and their religion and their beliefs. So he really does not care about such things at all. So for him, this is just an additional unnecessary headache. So he says, you know, why don't you just take him and um, uh, take, take this prisoner of yours and, um, you know, judge him in your, in your own, um, you know, uh, religious uh, court. Why are you bringing him over here? So that, that is when they say, you know, we want him executed. We want him killed. And we don't have the authority to do that because we are under Rom Roman subjugation. So we would need Roman authorization to execute him. And so when Pilate gets to know that they have brought him here, uh, brought Jesus over here to be executed, that is when he starts taking a little interest. He goes inside and he asks Jesus, you know, because Jesus being, is being held inside the palace courts. He goes and asks Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And then Jesus does not answer him straight away. He just says, um, are you inquiring whether I am the king of the Jews because you are interested? Or is it just something that you're repeating? Because you see here, right now, Jesus is giving this man an invitation to believe if he wishes to. Um, this is Pilate's golden chance. This is his chance to you know, um, have eternal life if he chooses. So Jesus um, starts, introduces this thought. He says, you know, are you making this inquiry because you are personally interested? Or are you just simply uh, saying what others have said? And uh, Pilate, you know, he just kind of casually replies, you know, am I a Jew? Your own people have brought you over here. So what have you done? Uh, so his um, basic concern is, are you claiming to be a king? Are you now going to try to, you know, um, uh, get onto the throne? Will this create political issues for me? So that's, that's all. You know, his interest is along those lines uh, because... Pilate right now is living under um, the rule of, of Tiberius. Tiberius is the Roman emperor at this time. And Tiberius was a very um, fearful. Uh, he, he, uh, Tiberius was kind of you know scared. He was uh, very paranoid, always wondering whether someone is trying to you know take over his power whether some king in uh, one of his um, you know, uh, vassal countries is trying to rebel against him. So uh, Tiberius was very strict with the officials and governors whom he had appointed in his different territories. And uh, he expected them to keep all kinds of rebellions and any kind of treason uh, under control so that his um, you know, uh, Roman emperorship should not be harmed in any way. So if Pilate is kind of lax regarding this serious situation. If Pilate allows a king to start creating um, trouble in one of the territories, then Pilate can actually get beheaded. So now, you know, that is the that is why the minute he hears that this person may be a king, he is worried, and so he comes and asks, "Are you the king?" And uh, so Jesus assures him in verse thirty-six and says. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest. And, you know, very specifically, we see that Jesus did not allow his servants to fight for him. He did not allow, uh, he did not prevent the arrest from taking place. Why? Because he has come over here to establish a spiritual kingdom right now. Yes, in the end times, the Lord will come to establish a physical kingdom as well. But right now, when he has come over here, uh, he has come 
with the purpose of establishing a spiritual kingdom. And so he tells uh, Pilate very openly, my kingdom is not of this world. OK, so once he says that, um, Pilate is no longer very concerned because this is not going to be a political issue. OK, so his only concern was that there should be no unrest in his immediate territory. And so uh, he he has uh, Jesus flogged, even though he realizes now that there is no political danger involved. He has him flogged just to please these uh, chief priests and Pharisees who have brought him. Uh, so even though he understands that Jesus is innocent, even though he knows that Jesus has not done a crime, he is willing to have an innocent man flogged just to maintain peace with these Jewish leaders. So all that matters to Pilate is staying in power, holding on to his position. He doesn't want anything to come in between that I know, um, and his position. So, um, so he has Jesus flogged. And then in uh, maybe we could know in chapter 19, uh, we can look at verses 7 to 12. Yeah. In chapter 19, if we can have someone read out for us, verses 7 to 12, please. I'm so sorry, you know, your voice is um, not audible. Um, you know, if we, uh, if, if you could have someone else uh, read out. Please. Uh, I'll try again. Uh, oh, wow. It's so clear now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just, yeah. uh, I just Go ahead. The, headphones. Yeah. the Jews answered him, we have a law. And according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more he, he was the more afraid and went again to Praetorium and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Uh, and 12, yes, 12. Yeah. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against, against Caesar. Yes. So we see that initially when Jesus says, No, my kingdom is not of this world, uh, Pilate kind of uh, is relieved. He uh, you know, uh, figures that there's no really poli no political threat involved over here. So he will in no way get himself into trouble with uh, Emperor Tiberius. So he kind of backs off. He has Jesus flogged. He assumes that this will please the leaders and they will take Jesus away with them and his problem will be over. And now the Jewish leaders continue to insist and they say, no, 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 uh, this person must be executed. You need to give permission for that because he is claiming that he is the son of God. And we have a law which says, that uh, anyone who claims to be the Messiah, that person should be killed. Actually, the simple truth is that, uh, you know, in the in the laws which uh, they drew up, you know, the Jewish people drew up over the centuries, um, anyone claiming to be a Messiah was not to be given actually a death sentence. No, I mean, this is not part of your law of Moses. Uh, these are all the um, legal laws and procedures which people came up with over the centuries. So. According to that law, anyone claiming messiahship uh, would not really be given a death sentence. But here they are outright lying to Pilate. And they're saying, in our law, according to our law, a person who claims messiahship should be put to death. And this man is saying that he is the son of God. 
now when pilate hears this in verse 8 it says he was even more afraid because he first of all understands that there's some uh, some religious issue going on uh, you know when jesus says uh, my kingdom is not of this world uh, so he is aware that he has had an innocent man flogged but now this innocent man he realizes uh, is someone who is saying that he is a son of god um, not a son of god the son of god and so he is afraid and he goes back inside and he says where do you come from because jesus said my kingdom is not of this world so now pilate is saying if your kingdom is not of this world where are you from he's kind of beginning to realize that there are greater spiritual implications here and uh, so he is in fact afraid his heart is being stirred um the holy spirit is convicting him of sin righteousness and judgment you know that's actually what is happening over here um and uh, jesus does not answer him because jesus answers when someone really wants the answer pilate is he really open to receive the answer jesus does not answer then he this pilate says do you refuse to speak to me i have the power to either set you free or have you you know killed so you better speak to me and then jesus says you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above and this really frightens pilate because he begin here i think he has actually in his spirit caught the truth that is not just a human that he is dealing with jesus said very openly my kingdom is not of this world and now uh, jesus is saying you have no power over me unless it is given to you from above he understands that something greater bigger is going on over here and now it says in verse 12 from then on pilate tried to set jesus free he is actually afraid he is actually feeling the conviction inside his spirit that there's something going on over here this is jesus personal invitation to this man i mean imagine how many leaders get to have a personal you know interaction with jesus ways offering him um a chance to repent and turn around and pilate who is kind of on the fence at the moment wondering what he should do uh, he finally makes his decision based on what the jewish leaders are saying this is what they say in verse 12 they say if you let this man go you are no friend of caesar anyone who claims to be a king opposes caesar so this jesus is claiming to be a king he is opposed to tiberius now if you are befriending this jesus then what's going to happen you are also going to be against tiberius when pilate heard this is what it says in the next verse verse 13 when pilate heard this he brought jesus out sat down on the judge's seat and gave his judgment it's such a sad thing so he wanted to hold on to his power even though he had sensed in his spirit that something is going on in fact he goes back and says where are you from because he understands begins to realize that this jesus is not just from this world there's something divine about him and he just you know snuffs out those truths yeah uh, for the sake of this power which he wants to hold on to he goes and sits down on the judge's seat and he gives his uh, judgment you know he agrees to the crucifixion so what did he get out of that maybe he held on to his power for another 10 years for another 20 years after that he ended up in hell for eternity so it's very sad the way people you know um prioritize their values was this really worth it i mean holding on to his power maybe for another 20 years 30 years and then for the rest of eternity he has lost out on the invitation given to him so it's it was really not a good deal at all you know it was such a foolish foolish deal that he chose um and uh, so even though pilate over here in verse um, 14 he says here is your king he says uh, to the jews for the jews shout and they say take him away take him away crucify him and um, so finally it says in verse 16 he handed jesus over to them to be crucified but at least one thing he was sure he wants to do so when he puts up that uh, you know uh, inscription regarding 
the this criminal who's going to be hung on the cross this is the wording which he puts up uh, so maybe we can read out verses 19 to 22 uh, if we could have someone read out for us 19 to 22 Yeah, if we can have any one of the students. Um, yeah, we had uh, Pastor John Paul reading for a while. If anyone else could volunteer, please. It's just a few verses. All you need to do is open your Bible and read it. Uh, so verses 19 to uh, 22, please. Yeah, go ahead, please. Chapter 19, mm. verse 19 to 22. Then the high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I uh, was... I brother, opened. this is 19, chapter 19? Uh, I mean, you're probably reading from chapter 18. So I read nine from chapter 19. Yes. And verse 19 to 22. Now, Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and it was the writing was. Then many of the Jews read the and the, the reading the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore, the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews. But he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What have I, what I have written, I have written. Here um, actually is proof that Pilate has sensed in his heart the truth which Jesus presented before him. So when he is putting the inscription over there, he does not, you know, they generally put over there the um, uh, an inscription telling the crime which the person has committed. So in, in case someone has, you know, committed a certain number of murders, that's basically what would be put over there on the inscription so that everyone would know why that man is being crucified because he's a very terrible, uh, you know, serial killer or a murderer or whatever. So over here, what is the crime that uh, Jesus has committed? He is the king. Okay, so he does not say that this man is claiming to be the king. He very openly just simply writes over there, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. And he writes it in three different languages so that nobody misses out on that. So this man who rejected the offer of eternal salvation which was being given to him, at least he does this because he has caught a glimpse of the truth and he has understood it at some level. And now he puts that in writing. And so the chief priests are very upset. And they say, you should have written that this man is claiming to be a king. Why are you writing over there that he is the king? And Pilate says, I have written what I have written. Yes, so it is a small uh, you know, um, concession that Pilate gave. Um, but it was actually not enough. He could have gone all the way and said, yes, this is the king. And I choose to submit to him. I choose to accept him. That would have just changed his entire eternity. But he chose not to do that. And uh, um, uh, so, um, yeah, he, he loses out on salvation. But, you know, God allows circumstances to be uh, orchestrated in this way so that what is finally put over there on that inscription is not just um, uh, a, a proclamation of the crime which this person has committed, but rather a declaration of who this person is, that he is the king of the Jews. Um, so in that capacity, as their king, uh, Jesus chooses to die for this nation of Israel. And then not only for the nation of Israel, but also for the entire world. Um, maybe we can uh, move into some final um, passages. I mean, simply because we have so much to cover. Um, 
if we could have someone maybe read out for us verses 28 to 30. So this is chapter 19. And if we could have someone read out for us 28, 29, 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were not accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and the field a sponge with sour wine put it on his soap and put it to his mouth. Now when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing, uh, and bow, uh, bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Yes, thank you. Um, so if you look at the other gospel accounts, we see that uh, earlier on, you know, during the crucifixion process, he was given another um, liquid to drink, you know, and uh, he refuses to drink that because that is something that will dull the pain. Because, I mean, you know, the crucifixion is a highly painful process uh, where they're uh, literally hammering, uh, you know, nails into your uh, wrists and, you know, into your feet. So they tend to give you something that will dull the pain a little bit. And at that point, Jesus says, no, he refuses to drink that because he is over here to bear the pain, uh, to, to become the sacrifice on behalf of the of entire humanity. And so he wants his mind to stay alert. He wants to go through that entire process, fully you know, experience the entire thing, uh, because this is the punishment that he is taking upon himself on behalf of the world, so that the world will not have to you know, face the wrath of God. Uh, so he does not drink that uh, earlier you know, liquid that was offered. But now it says, knowing that everything had now been finished, now he is willing to uh, drink what they are, or, you know, what they are offering. So, um, so uh, now Jesus says, I am thirsty. And then in verse 29, he, uh, it says, uh, yeah, you know, the, the version which, uh, you know, sister read out, it talks about sour uh, wine. Now, this is something that was a um, cheaper kind of wine, I mean, which the uh, ordinary people would uh, drink. You know, I mean, no, not that kind of expensive wine which is drunk by those who are, uh, you know, more wealthy. This is just something which maybe the laborers and, you know, the poorer people would drink. Um, so that, that is basically given to Jesus now. And he's very thirsty. Uh, he drinks that. Uh, when you look at uh, Psalm 22, that's basically where we, uh, where we are told what he's feeling in his body when, the, when this whole thing is going on. Because over there, it talks about how his mouth is so parched, you know, that, the, that his uh, tongue is sticking to the roof of the mouth. Um, that's because on the cross, he would literally be gasping for breath. Because, you know, um, I mean, you know, you, you would have heard sermons about this. You know, because of the positioning on that cross, uh, you can't breathe un until you lift yourself up on your feet. Each time you lift yourself up on your feet, you can feel the, you know, the, the nails which are there um, on your feet poking in. And so he would be gasping for breath. His mouth is completely dry, but he does not drink until he has finished the entire, um, you know, process of uh, atonement. And so in verse 28, it says, later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. And now he, you know, they, they hand it up to him with a sponge um, and he sucks on the sponge. He drinks that. And then it says, uh, he says in verse 30, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He didn't just die. He voluntarily gave up his spirit. He chose the timing when he would give up his spirit. So this was all throughout this entire um, you know, uh, description that we have of the arrest and of the entire trial proceedings and the crucifixion. We see that Jesus is very much in charge. Nowhere at no point is he helpless. He is completely in charge of all that is taking place. He is volunteering to subject himself to the different things which are being done. At any point, if he had wished to walk away, he could have walked away. So now he even chooses the moment at, at which point he's going to give up his spirit. Because generally, when people were crucified, they would be hanging over there for days. 
you know, for two, three days uh, because it's a very slow death. Uh, but in Jesus' case, he has not just come over there to hang on a cross. He has come over there to atone for the sins of the world. So once that is done, he gives up his spirit because his work is completed. So even death, is under his control. He gets to decide when he wants to give up his spirit. And um, so the, we have the famous words which Jesus speaks where he says, it is finished. And uh, you know, as most of us know, uh, the Greek word that is used over there is uh, tetelestai. Okay, tetelestai, which basically is talking about complete, uh, uh, um, total completion. I mean, as in, um, if, it, if it's a project that you're working on, you can say, when you, you would say uh, Tetelestai time when it's totally fully finished. There's nothing, no component of it is left. It's, it's now been um, uh, closed, finalized in every way. So, you know, that, that is the kind of term that is used. So, Jesus, having understood in verse 28 that everything had now been finished, he now declares it out verbally and he says, it is finished, and having done the task for which he has been sent, he gives up his spirit. So, um, Isaiah 53 5, you know, explains to us what exactly was finished. Uh, so, we learn in Isaiah 53, um, uh, you know, verses 3 to 5, in the last portion where it says he was bruised for our iniquities, um, it says he was wounded for our transgressions. And then it says the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And then the last portion, it says his stripes, by his stripes, we are healed. So these are the things which were finished. Uh, we see that the transgressions and the iniquities which we have committed, the price for that has been paid uh, for by him. The chastisement, the, 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 the correction, the judgment, which should have come upon us was put upon him. Why? For our peace, so that God can be at peace with us, so that God would no longer be angry and wrathful against us, so that we can have peace with this Almighty God. He chooses to have the judgment poured out upon him rather than upon us. So now, peace has been established between God and us, and not just peace but also healing has been imparted. So there are two things over here that have been completely, totally finished. First, peace has been established between the Almighty One and us. Anyone who comes to this Almighty God in the name of Jesus Christ, they will be granted peace with God. God is not at wrath uh, against them. He is not angry with them. And the second thing is healing, physical healing, emotional healing has been imparted to everyone who comes to the Father in the name of Jesus. Now, um, 1 Thessalonians 2.13. If we practice what's given in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, then what Jesus did on the cross you know, becomes effective in our lives. If we don't really practice 1 Thessalonians 2.13, we don't enjoy, even though Jesus declared and said it is finished, we will not enjoy that finished work unless we practice 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Let's turn in our Bibles. You know, if we can have one person read out for us, 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Very important scripture. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received, you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also eff effectively work in you who believe. Amen. Exactly. These Thessalonians, when they heard the words which Paul and his team were preaching, they didn't accept them as human teachings being presented by a team. No, they accepted them as the word of God. And because they accepted those words as the word of God, 
that word began to work in them effectively. And that is what can happen for us if we can take the scripture where Jesus declared and said it is finished. Are we willing to believe it as the word of God to us? That it was not just a statement made by John the writer, but it was the uh, divine word of God being released when he said it is finished. When he said that what he had uh, prophesied in Isaiah 53, 3 to 5 is now being fulfilled. It's being completed. Because first in Peter understood that. Because when first uh, when Peter wrote down first Peter 2.24, he says, he uses the past tense. He says, by his wounds, you have been healed. It's a finished work. It's been completed. It's not something that's going to be done in the future. It's already done uh, in uh, Isaiah 53, which was written before the crucifixion. You know, you, you just have the um, open present tense being used over there. But when first Peter 2.24 refers to the same verse, he says, by his wounds, you have been healed. Because Peter understands that the process was finished, completed, just as Jesus declared, you know, when he said it is finished. So those of us who choose to accept this as the divine word of God, we will discover that this word starts working in our lives. And it, can, um, it will accomplish what the word has been released to accomplish. So nothing can stop that. So it all comes down to how we respond to the truths which are presented over here, um, whether we choose to believe them as the divine fulfilled word. If we do that, that word begins to work inside us in, in all of its power, and it will accomplish the purpose for which it was released from Jesus' mouth on the cross. So it's a very mighty thing that is being offered to us as a gift. You know, so we need to accept these scriptures as the truth um, and uh, walk in it. And when we do that, the power which is there in that, in that word uh, begins to work in our lives to accomplish all that it is meant to. All right. So, um, all right. Uh, we really don't have much time left. Um, maybe we can look at some very um, important points that are left. Um, OK, uh, maybe verses 32 to 37, if someone could read out uh, John 19, verses 32 to 37. Then the soldiers came and brought the leg of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may... I'm so sorry, your voice faded out. Um, I'm assuming that uh, we, we could hear up to verse 35, and then yeah, it just kind of faded out. So it's yeah, that's fine. Uh, so um, the the Jewish leaders they have finished crucifying the Messiah. They knew that he is the Messiah. He gave them clear signs of who he is. So in spite of knowing the truth, they chose to crucify him. And now they're very deeply concerned about the Sabbath day, that the Sabbath will somehow be corrupted if they allow dead bodies to be hanging over there. And so they request and say, you know, if you could kindly kill these people who have been, um, you know, who are hanging over there uh, before, you know, the um, entire Sabbath uh, takes place so that, you know, uh, the Sabbath day is not corrupted. It's so hypocritical. I mean, they have uh, participated in a hypocrisy. They have uh, brought false charges. They have uh, killed an innocent man. They've done all that. And now they're so deeply concerned that you know, the, the Sabbath day should not be contaminated. I mean, they, they've done everything possible to contaminate the Sabbath day. And now they're so concerned that the body should not be left hanging. And that's the reason why, in this particular case, they don't leave the you know uh, the uh, the criminals hanging over there for two three days which was generally you know what used to happen so they want the people dead so that 
uh, you know they can remove their bodies so their soldiers come they break the legs of the uh, two criminals because those men are still alive and but when they come to jesus again it's very clearly mentioned that he was already dead um and uh, so it's it's kind of being you know uh, emphasized that jesus chose when to give up his spirit he voluntarily um decided to give up his spirit and um, again uh, john you know stresses and he says he in fact one of the soldiers wanted to make sure so he pierces the side of jesus and you have a uh, blood and water flowing out so this is john telling us that you know i actually stood there i saw it happening i saw the blood and water coming out it was proof that jesus was indeed dead okay because afterwards rumors started saying that ah uh, no he didn't really die and you know all those false uh, rumors which these um, um religious leaders wanted to uh, you know spread so uh, here uh, john is writing for his readers and saying see i was standing over near the cross you know during the entire process so i know i saw it happening i saw jesus side being pierced i saw the blood and water coming out this was indeed a definitely dead person and then he says in verse 36 not one of his bones will be broken that scripture was fulfilled and the scripture which says they will look on the one that they have pierced these scriptures were literally fulfilled and john says i was the in you know, the one who who watched all this happening and my testimony is true is what he uh, says and then you know in the in the few minutes that we have left um if we can just look at one more um, uh, you know fact which is mentioned that would be verse 41 where it says at the place where jesus was crucified there was a garden and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid so that is the place where jesus is uh, buried uh, so it is very important for john to write over here for his readers that this was a new tomb no other bodies had ever been placed inside this tomb now uh, in those days the well to do families who could afford their own burial chamber these would basically be caves you know so they would take a large cave they would buy a large cave and so inside that cave they would have generations of their family you know being buried so um, inside the cave they would have many maybe you could use the word shelf you know like small small shelves being created uh, so you when, when when the person is first buried they would place them in one particular portion of the cave allow a few years to go by you know so that the the dead body kind of dries out and all the internal organs you know the fluids that are there everything comes out uh, so finally the the body kind of shrivels up and now you just have skin and you have bones so at that point of time they would very uh, reverentially pick up those bones and put them inside one of those you know the, the shelf compartments which they have dug into the sides of the cave so in that way they are able to uh, have entire generations of the family being kept inside that particular tomb uh, so they would have a special kind of a box and in that box they would keep the remains of the different family members so over here in this tomb there are no other bones there are no other bodies stored so when the resurrection takes place and the one single person who is supposed to be inside disappears there's no other body over there in case they had been in case it had, it had been an older tomb then someone could have said oh you know jesus just uh, deteriorated decomposed extra fast and so the body lying over there that actually is jesus they could have said that but you see this is a brand new tomb which uh, you know joseph of arimathea has never ever used so there is no other body in there there was only one person placed in there and that person disappeared he was resurrected and uh, so no false claims could be made about jesus so this was another important fact which john includes over here so that his readers can be fully assured that jesus indeed died and jesus indeed rose up from the dead okay so this is his him confirming that he has witnessed these things and is recording these details for his readers to know all right uh, maybe we can quickly close with a word of prayer 
Lord, we just thank you so much for all the things that we could cover today uh, from your scriptures. Uh, Lord, uh, we thank you for the intercessory prayer that you prayed for all of your disciples, including us, O oh Lord, who are there today. We thank you, O oh Lord, that because of your prayer, even today we are being kept, we are being protected by the power of the name of Jesus. We thank you, O oh Lord, that because of your intercessory prayer, even today, we are going through this process of sanctification. May we are getting more and more set apart for you. And our relationship with you is growing deeper. Our relationship with the world is getting weaker. Thank you so much, O oh Lord, that you are doing this for us. And we thank you that because of this, one day, you are going to proudly present us before the Father without blemish, without fault. I mean, what a privilege, O oh Lord, that we uh, who were sinners have now are now going to be glorified to the extent where we will be confirmed to the image of Jesus Christ himself. What a privilege we have been given, O oh Lord. So we pray that we would um, uh, serve you in a way, O oh Lord, that honors and glorifies you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Hello, Pastor. Hello. Uh, Hello. Yeah, 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 I can hear you. You have a question, is it? Uh, sorry, I joined the class late. Maybe you have, could have already addressed this issue. Uh, the assignment, I cannot access the assignment. If you want to permission to access. Okay, I will uh, I will inform the IT team, you know, in case maybe there's some technical issue, they will uh, clear it for you. I will definitely inform them, sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you.